Hi, everyone. I'm Jace Chambers. I am the Manager of Education and Community Engagement here with Opera Lafayette. And I want to thank you so much for joining us for our Moreau and Handel's Esther Salon series. We're going to learn a little bit more about our upcoming production uh, coming to D.C. on February 8th and coming to uh, New York, I believe, May, May 9th. I mean, I believe it's May 9th. Yes. And um, so today I'm going to hand it over to Ryan Brown, who's going to do some introductions for us before we begin um, our talk. Well, thank you, Jace, and, and, and welcome everyone, and, and particularly welcome uh, Anne and Justin. Um, I thought I'd, I'd tell people a little bit about the just the gestation of this program. Um, people know that we not only do French music, but we do the music that was influenced by by French music and culture. And so I'd always been interested in the fact that, that um, there were two pieces done uh, that were two texts of Racine, the great 17th century French playwright, um, one on Esther and one on uh, Atali, that were subsequently taken up and uh, set by Handel in the, uh, in the 18th century. And so I thought, oh, I don't know if there's, is there, is, what kind of connection is there there? Um, and so this was an opportunity to sort of put music by Moreau, a composer we haven't presented before, um, with music uh, uh, with music by Handel, both on subjects of, of Esther. Um, and we it, it turns out, however, that there's a lot to talk about with Moreau and La Racine and, um, and the school of Saint-Cyr, which the um, uh, Madame de Maintenon uh, founded. Uh, Madame de Maintenon being the, the, the last and more genetic wife, wife of Louis XIV. And so um, we're really fortunate to have the person who's probably the world's expert on, on Esther, um, Anne Piejus, with us. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little about her from her biography. She starts it by saying um, that uh, she works at the interface between music, the performing arts, and the cultural and cultural history, which means she's a, a musicologist after our own heart. Um, and she has uh, won several prizes at the Conservatoire National Supérieur de Musique de Paris. How'd I do? Um, and she's a former fellow at the Villa uh, Medici in Rome. Um, she wrote her PhD on Esther and Atelier and the music theater at Saint-Cyr. Um, she's also produced performances, and she's co-edited uh, Moliere's comedy ballets, and she's even been a musical director for a production of Moliere during uh, the fourth centenary of, uh, in, in 2022. Um, in addition to that, she's a specialist in Italian Renaissance and Baroque spiritual music, and she, um, uh, she founded and directed the Mercure Galant program at the at the national um, well the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, um, which produces an uh, enriched digital editions of texts on the arts, scores, and prints. And as part of the program, she's created a fun artistic crowdsourcing site, Voix du Mercure Galant, Galant uh, .org, open to all enthusiasts, and you're all invited to take part. So I'll put that a little later in the in the chat so you can go to it. Um, but I just I just did, and it's got some wonderful stuff. If you if you want to hear French read just beautifully. Um, go see the, either the talk on Esther or the talk on uh, La. What was it? Um, you took it was a takeoff on L'histoire du soldat of Stravinsky, but it's L'histoire du fille uh, the, is soldat. Is that correct? And that so. La fille soldat. Uh, yeah, it was and uh, the or the the woman soldier. Uh, so that was uh, that was fun, and I urge you to do the same. Um, I, before I, I'll go ahead and introduce Justin, who, who Opera Lafayette audiences probably know from his performances with us last year. Um, I can just say that at a very young age, he won the Bruges competition uh, as a harpsichordist and then went on to win many other prizes. Uh, and of course, a, a career ensued and he's played for most everyone at the BBC or at the Philharmonie at the Louvre in, in Paris. And of course, um, uh, with us in, in, in the United States in addition to other tours. Uh, he has a lot of recordings out. If you want uh, one on La Famille Forqueret and another it's coming out of La Famille uh, Rameau and 
Uh, he's even done a solo disc with um, devoted to both Scarlatti and Ligeti, the 20th century composer. Uh, so he does contemporary music as well. And of course, he plays chamber music, um, uh, not only as you've heard with us, but with his own group, Le Consort, uh, and they've recorded a number of things. Um, not uh, um, hardly uh, last but not least, uh, you know him from a recital that he did with us last year, which with Jacob Ashworth, our concertmaster, and he was to uh, lead our Rameau Io, but he had the best excuse in the world to uh, cancel that, which is that he's just had his first child. And uh, so we're, we appreciate both Anne and Justin being up very late uh, in Paris and being with us. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Anne to give a presentation about uh, Esther and Saint-Cyr, and then we'll go into conversation with her and Justin. Uh, we'll speak a bit and then conversation with everyone. So welcome. Thank you very much, Ryan. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm delighted to present a program to the concert around the figure of Esther. Uh, Justin has chosen extracts from two musical works, both exceptional for their artistic qualities, but also for historical reasons. The first one by Jean-Baptiste Moreau is typically French and dates from 1689, the era of Louis XIV and French classicism. The second one is later. It is composed by George Friedrich Handel for, for an official English troupe and orchestra. The delicacy of the first one did not allow mixing the two works. For this reason, the concert was designed in two parts, and so will be my speech, actually. The link between the two is therefore the story of Esther and the tragedy of French author Jean Racine. Next. Next, Esther was very famous in iconography, as you can see here in a very baroque Italian painting. And next, in the very famous Poussin painting of Esther. Thank you. The plot of Esther, Esther borrowed from the Old Testament, is set in Babylon. In, in Persia, at the time of the exile of the Jewish people, 5th century before Christ. The names of the protagonists are inspired from the Mesopotamian culture. Esther, in fact, is Ishtar, Mordecai is Marduk, and they are the heroes. Haman is the villain, and Aswerus is the king, and Aswerus in, in Greek would be Xerxes. Haman, the cruel minister of King Ahasuerus, has obtained an edict condemning all the Jews in the Babylonian Empire to death on the pretext that one of them, Mordecai, refuses to bow to power. Mordecai understands the danger and alerts his niece Esther, the king's favorite, to whom she has hidden her Jewishness. He urges her to intercede with Ahasuerus to obtain mercy for his people. Providence comes to their rescue. The king, tormented by a dream, remembers that Mordecai once saved him from a plot. And then Asuerus orders Haman to lead him, to lead Mordecai in triumph into the city. Haman, of course, obeys only reluctantly and consults himself in thinking of the torment he is preparing for his enemy. However, Esther decides to enter the king's house, despite the prohibition against going near, and asks for the favor of having Hasuerus to dinner in Ammon's presence. She throws herself at the king's feet, confesses that she's a Jew, begs for mercy, and reveals Haman's plans. Hasuerus is touched. He revokes the edict and delivers Haman to the execution prepared for Mordecai. This story, which is now placed in the Old Testament between the book of Judith and the first book of Maccabees, was probably written in the second century before Christ and does not correspond to any historical event. But still, it testifies to good knowledge of the ancient Persian, cu Pers Persian culture sorry. during the first centuries, common era. It was not included in the Bible due to the violence of the story. In fact, Esther is presented in Racine's tragedy as a young and gentle woman who, 
But as soon as she has triumphed in the biblical tradition, she avenges her people by ordering the massacre of their enemies. This book was nevertheless popular from the beginning because Esther's triumph, as you may know, was celebrated with the Feast of Purim in the Je Jewish tradition. It was later integrated into the Christian Bible and Jewish Torah. The story of Esther has always been considered a religious symbol. God is omnipresent, and it is also the story of the rescue of people oppressed because of their religion. The subject was brought back into fashion by French humanists from the 16th century, Protestant or Catholic author, authors like Robert Garnier, who published Tragedy in Verse entitled Les Juives in 1582 in Paris. Next. Next. Yeah, thank you. The great French author Jean Racine here in a portrait. This is Edison. 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 But Racine had never written biblical drama. Furthermore, he was not in favor of opera and the setting of text to music, but he received a royal commission and couldn't escape from writing it. He, he had to accept it. In 1688, in fact, next, Madame de Maintenon, the second wife of King Louis XIV, saw twilight the educational institutions she, she had set up in Saint Cyr near Versailles. Next. Here, Madame de Maintenon with her niece as a, um, a pedagogue, um, a painting by Mignard. Next. Here, you can see the royal house at Saint-Cyr, where um, uh, Louis XIV accommodated, the, the school accommodated 250 noble girls from age 7 to 20. The education next was funded by the king. Next, and now you will see what remains from the school on the, this, this chapel. Next, here you can see a demoiselle, a young lady. Next, here a young teacher, a religious teacher. And next, a religious dame of Saint Cyr. The demoiselle practiced. Theatre, in fact, and used to sing music at the chapel. Next. Madame de Maintenon commissioned Racine to write a kind of moral poem with music. The royal couple certainly proposed the composer Jean Baptiste Moreau for the task. Esther encompassed all the elements that contributed to the success of court cool spectacle at the time tragedy, music, elaborate stage settings sumptuous Persian style tafta costumes, and even jewelry borrowed from the king's wife. It was a collaborative effort of the foremost court artists, Racine, the very famous designer and decorator Jean Bérin, and the musician Jean Baptiste Moreau, less known. Moreau was trained at Angers Cathedral as a choir boy and was both a church musician and a singing master. At that time, he was seeking protection. He had just composed a court entertainment, Les Bergers de Marly, which has served as the competition to recruit a music master for the Dauphine. The commission of Esther was then a consolation prize. Moreau was a little unstable. He frequented cabarets, above all those at Rue Saint-Jacques, very close from here. Um, Still, he composed intermeds for several biblical tragedies written for the Demoiselle and set to music three spiritual canticles by Racine. Then he left Paris for Languedoc and later came back and ended his life very poor. Racine's Esther is a brief tragedy in three acts. Next. Moreau composed and Intermeds, that's to say, musical pieces to be played before the drama 
in a prelude you can uh, you can see here an overture and at the end of each act moreover some of the scenes alternate speaking and singing it is very likely that Racine worked with the musician Moreau so that the verses could be suitable for singing the characters are spoken words and the sun verses are composed for the choir of young girls in Esther Sweet. Sweet. Yeah. Next. Moreau, therefore, composed choirs, but also solos, duettos, and trios, all for female voices. You can see here the end of a sung part of the tragedy and then the, the uh, uh, choir introduced by solos. The sung pieces do not advance the action, they comment on it. Hassid and Moreau wanted to reconnect with the tradition of ancient choruses and gave priority to con constructing, contrasting sorry, emotions such as desolation, supplication, confidence, and joy. Only once an Israelite sings to advertise the king to listen to Esther. I propose we listen to this beautiful aria with in instrumental introduction. Thank you, Chase. At the premiere, instrumentalists and female singers from the Chambre du Roi, which was one of the three musical royal institutions, mingled on stage with the teenagers to form a choir of 24 girls and to take on the most demanding solos. The musical style is very French and was inspired by contemporary air sérieux. Voices are not virtuosic, but emphasizes the text. The harmony, far from Italian effects, underscores the delicacy of these intermeds composed for very young performers. And if we have time, I'd like to listen with you a very sweet solo for um, written for a probably very young singer with two recorders. Thank you, Chase.
Thank you. Next, the tragedy and its music met with great success. No, 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 Bef before that. No, so sorry. They were copied in the French royal collections and printed. The music was printed so. In the 18th century, Racine's play was successful in Dutch colleges, where the children of French Protestants were educated. Dutch composer Servas de Koning has written new music for, the girl, for a girls' college in Amsterdam. Now, the second part of the concert takes us to England in the 1730s. Can, well, I, can I interrupt one sec? And yes. I was just, um, I, I thought that I'd tell our, our audience, and I think actually another scholar who um, is admiring of your work and has quoted it is in your audience, Ben Bernard. He's written a, um, a, a piece uh, for us, which people will get get later, which talks about both Saint-Cyr and, um, uh, and the male college, the Collège Mazarin, um, and exactly why those colleges were both founded in um, in the 1680s, and um, uh, by uh, as sort of alternatives to colleges in the church, and um, the uh, so I thought maybe I just I just mentioned that there we have some some more background on that uh, in a couple of weeks um, that uh, before we go move to to Handel and and uh, and the second part of the program. Oh, and there's Ben's, Ben's giving us the thumbs up and, and nodding there. Good. So go ahead, Anne. Thank you. So Handel, Handel was a very famous uh, composer, European composer, if I may, born in Germany, passed through Italy, then he occupied the first place in England, as you know. His Esther triumphed in London in 1732 creating the new genre of the English oratorio. At that time, in England, biblical subjects were very fashionable. In fact, Racine's tragedy was translated with many modifications, many modifications by Brereton, and it was published in 1715 under the title Esther of Faith Triumphant. And most, uh, most probably, Endel knew Racine's tragedies but and Esther, above all, but he didn't know uh, Moreau's music. A few years after Brereton's translation, a group of poets, including Pope, produced a mask, that's to say a brief opera given in English, which in turn inspired the librettist and translator Samuel Humphreys, who wrote a libretto for Handel. As a successful composer, Handel attracted patronage of noblemen. He was based at Burlington House, and in 1617, he moved and settled in the magnificent house next. Built by the Count of Chandos, you can see here with his family, next. A beautiful house at Cannons in Middlesex, becoming Cannons' resident composer for two years. Chandos maintained a musical establishment, and his musical standards were very high. The music director for 20 years there at Cannes was the German composer Johann Christoph Pepusch. Handel's first Esther was composed in 1718 at Cannes with Italian and French instrumentalists, but English singers, and it was probably performed on stage. The work was resumed in, 70, in 1720. And nowadays, some musicologists try to uh, publish the, the second version, 1720. Fourteen years later, Handel had become very famous as an opera composer. 1732, he had his Esther performed again, but a pirate performance prompted him to revisit the libretto and score extensively. The new version, which you will hear, thanks to Justin, was performed at the King's Theatre in Haymarket. Next. Handel had Italian opera singers. Next. Sorry. And an orchestra at his disposal, explaining the dimensions of the work. Doing so, he created this new musical genre, that of English oratorio. One could wonder 
why he wrote an oratorio and not, and not an opera? First answer for language, language issues, since Esther was the reworking of an English mask, while the opera was always in Italian in England at that time. Second reason, the Bishop of London forbade the work based on the Bible to be performed on stage. Next. Traveler and music amateur Charles Burney recorded the premiere. This is the uh, announce of the premiere. And uh, you, can, you can read, Dr. Gibson, then Bishop of London, would not grant permission for its being represented on that stage. Mr. Handel had it performed at the theater, but in still life, still life with no, not on stage. Esther became the prototype of the English oratorio. It is a concert work without staging sets or costumes. The characters sing and the action advances through music. The choir and the soloists who stand out from it, the Israelites, express lamentation, imploration, as in the great concertante aria, praise the Lord. And it's for a safe, save us the Lord. Next, you can hear, you can see, you see here, oh, sorry, this, there are the characters, solo, solo world, solo characters. Next, you see here the beginning of uh, this five voice choir. Lamentation, imploration, but also, of course, rejoicing with the choir, the Lord, how an enemy has slain. The action and most of the expression come back to the characters. For the first time, Handel drew on his knowledge gathered from stays in Germany, Italy and England. That's how it differs from the later integrative works, integrative oratorios. On the one hand, Esther, Esther uses the aesthetics of Italian opera seria. For example, the beautiful aria, Praise the Lord, takes up all the codes of opera arias. The great virtuosity, the instrumental ritornello, the da capo structure with the first part entirely repeated at the end so that the singer can adorn it and show all his agility. On the, on the other hand, the influence of the German cantata is also prominent. In fact, nine out of 31 sections of Esther harken back to the previously composed Brooks Passion, created in Hamburg and which London listeners could not have known. This kind of reuse was then commonplace and Handel reused the, the choruses of his anthems in almost all these later oratorios, changing obviously uh, the words. Handel sang arias originally composed for the pied soul or the daughter of Zion to the character of Esther and he adapts to the villain Haman arias composed for Judas but even for Jesus. The result is a work that is pathetic and powerfully expressive even if there are some dramatic inconsistencies uh, because of these reuses such as Haman's final aria who sings about the power of forgiveness, which is not in the, obviously in Racine's tragedy. This association of classical French tragedy, German cantata and Italian opera makes Esther a work characteristic of the monumental English style, an exceptional synthesis based on, on expressiveness, great musical means and written for opera lovers, of course, at a market. So I hope that the concert will delight you as much as it pleased the courtiers of Louis XIV and the London public in the, the opera lovers of the uh, 18th century. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Maybe, uh, Justin, could you add something or... The, yes, just I was gonna I was gonna say something about the the Duke of Chandos, who I I always thought that was such an interesting kind of um, place where things were created. Asus and Galateo is created yes. was created there, and then um, and so the which was kind of a smaller, more intimate version. And then I also remember I think that the Duke of Chandos's fortune um, was highly speculative, and didn't he flame out? And and lose all of his uh, fortune and and was no longer able to patronize such wonderful things. Very uh, 
was shortly after these yeah. works were yeah, created. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and as he's in Galatea, as the same score scoring, I, I don't know how to say it in English. Yeah, scoring, scoring right. Uh, uh, yes, uh, than uh, Esther, yeah. because there were the, the same musicians. But yes, in the in the twenties, it declined. So the musician would go away when the. the yeah, right, right, right. It was a place. <laughs> well, Justin, I was wondering um, about the 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 music. Um, first of all, does it we you know this is the first time we've really heard Moreau's music, and mm -hmm. and who does it does it, what does it remind you of of other other things that you've done, and. Uh, hi everyone. I I hope you hear me well. Um, and please, uh, I mean, I'm so so happy to be with you all uh, this evening and um, I have the feeling my job of musician is also to be with the good people in the right place and to be with uh, with Ryan, with Jonathan, with uh, all the Opera Lafayette team and with Anne, with all her explanation. It's so helpful and uh, exciting. And uh, yeah, I was just saying in the chat, I just love this music because I, I, I have the feeling that Moreau, Moreau has such uh, uh, sensitivity and he manages to express so well the um, deception and the waiting and the struggle of the Esther piece. And so, yeah, that, that this music uh, moves me so much and I, I hope it will move you too when you will listen to it in Washington or New York. I noted it reminded me a little when I first read through it that uh, with some of its chromaticism, it reminded me a little of, Pers yeah. of Purcell. And I, absolutely, yeah. And, and the f f first, uh, I mean, the concert will begin with the uh, uh, Moro Ouverture. And then the first aria is pleurons gémissons. Uh, so let's uh, cry and weep. And uh, uh, and exactly the it's the like mostly the same bass line than in the Dido's Lament of uh, Purcell. And I figure it out. It was written exactly the same year in 1689. So it's it's quite quite funny to see how probably they didn't know about each other, but. To see, like it's the same uh, uh, tonality, uh, G minor, with the same bass line, and it's uh, same expressing the same uh, emotion. So yeah, it's so so funny to see the both. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad you thought that too. I was, and yeah. I was, the, and the example that Anne played, and you played, um, il apaise, um, il pardon, um, that when it starts, there's it's. It sounds almost like it's going to be a shuk, a shakon, some yeah, of it, yeah. isn't it? But then it yeah, changes. Really. Then it changes, right? And and I, I, I think Moreau is somehow between the uh, style of uh, Lully, and we have a lot of uh, shakon of of Lully in mind. And Lully w was born like maybe twenty or thirty years before uh, Moreau, and he's leading to the later eighteenth century style. So he's quite in between and i think it's um uh, it makes his music so different and interesting and thank you ryan for having having uh, bring this composer to me because i vaguely heard about moro but i mean i didn't knew his music and i discovered with you and Anne and all these projects uh, atali and esther and it's i think it's such a great music, so I'm very happy to perform it. Yeah, and, and you don't hear it because it's because, as Anne says, it's it's incidental music, and it really. I mean, we won't have the young actors singing, but uh, but it. Um, I, but as as Anne said, it 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 amplifies the emotions of, mm -hmm. of the piece, and I was. I thought I'd also tell people that we have a we we commissioned an essay from Philip Kennicott, the cultural critic of the um, Washington Post, to to sort of talk about um, this in the context of contemporary issues, and and he's made some fascinating uh, comparisons about. Well, he's talked about the scandal with which and uh, that the this piece was uh, the, precipitated the performance of this, and I maybe Anne could speak ab about that a little bit, but I. Uh, and then he's talked about essentially what it was like to see young women do these expressive things on stage, and um, and that 
and and the con and what Ben will talk about is the conflict between religion and the court and the the intent and I, I it occurred to me that the pieces the excerpts that you've chosen Justin um, after we hear that um, the lament you mentioned after we hear the supplication the mm -hmm. sort of prayer to God then we hear the happy people and then we hear them talking about the just king and and the, the how a wise and just king does the right things and doesn't listen to evil um uh cor you know courtiers or advice like like the text you showed Anne. and and then of course it ends with the praise of god mm -hmm. and so i wondered Anne, if you could tell us a little bit because it's really obviously there's got to be some um some uh, um analogy to the king um, and the wisdom of Louis the Fourteenth, as he comes to listen, and yet you're in a religious institution and you have to praise God as well, and so there's sign of attention there, isn't there, that they're trying to do two things? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I think you're right. There are applications, you know, in French, application. One could uh, try to interpret, uh, to inter yeah, to to see. Uh, characters as real persons and so uh, Madame de Maintenon has been compared to Esther of course Pierce Esther and the Vastis the, the first wife of Asrus would have been um, Madame de Montespan the beautiful uh, mistress of the, the king the former mistress of the king. but uh, I think the success well the the success was was real, and these teenagers loved uh, being on stage singing, and and then a, a, a moral uh, criticism came out. But the main point is that Madame de Maintenon needed some some brilliant action to <laughs> to uh, to highlight her action. Um, and to 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 comfort a position at the court, which was not easy. Um, the moral issue has been, I think, a bit exaggerated because there is a legend saying that the girls uh, um, started playing Andromaque, a tragedy of love and uh, faith and uh, a very dramatic tragedy. Uh, but uh, this legend, this is probably not true because I couldn't find any trace of it in the archives. And uh, it was this courtier, Madame de Calus, who, who said it, but she, 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 she told that as she was nearly dying, she was quite, uh, quite old. And uh, this was uh, 50 years later. So one can wonder if it's true of, or if if she could remember or if she invented this story which is quite um huh. is is the um, story I don't know. <laughs> is it that's andromach you said the, yes the, yeah but Even after, after uh -huh. and after and this that was is it was is it true that they decided that the next perf the performance of atali which was written and performed after esther would not be public is that correct yes it, this is correct because the the royal couple uh, commissioned atelier just after uh Esther was performed was premiered and then they realized that for uh for this criticism coming from the clergy they should be more discreet and because one of the the, the young ladies um get out from the, the school and get married. So it was, it was a scandal just for the bishop, for no one else. But still, they wanted to be more uh, regular. And for political reasons, uh, Louis XIV needed to transform Saint-Cyr into a convent. Because he wanted to, he, you know, he was Gallican and the French religion was quite far from the Roman Catholicism, and he wanted to make peace with the Pope, and had to to had to, uh, had to say that to um, concede. Uh, just uh, would you help me? Uh, uh, no, no. 
uh, to accept some some mm -hmm. compromises. And so, the um, Justin, what what tell us a little about the process of 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 learning this. I know um, I was I was happy that you two were able to. I don't think you knew each other before before this piece, right? And so, but you met in Paris and 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 talked a little about you know what. And you you had to choose from. I mean, we gave you a, the the handle is quite a long piece, and mm -hmm. you had to, you had to choose um, excerpts. And how did you choose them? And and um, for to to try to make a whole and were you considering the Moreau and the handle together and and I know that you and 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 Jonathan Woody talked a little bit about that Jonathan who will be leading our vocalists and playing the bad guy Aman um, uh, so do, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, that your process yeah, yeah uh, of course it, it was one of the of the challenges of this project because uh as you heard, I, I'm fond of French music, but it has kind of special um, style. And I was afraid if we have mixed uh, Moreau and Handel back and forth, that uh, Moreau wouldn't find the good place alongside Handel. So I, the very, very beginning, I decided to like make a first part with Moreau and a second with Handel. But then the second challenge was to choose uh, which uh, areas to uh, to perform in the Moro. And uh, of course, it, there are no questions about uh, keeping all the Racine play because I was a bit anxious for the American audience to listen to three hours of Racine in old French. <laughs> so uh, so we, we decided to, to keep only the musical uh, um, pieces. And... Uh, but then I, I was wondering how to keep the uh, narrative coherence and to uh, that all the audience will be able to follow the story of Racine. And so I, I tried a lot of different uh, things and uh, I end up to this version we will perform uh, next month. But then I was a bit uh, anxious about the legitimacy of making cuts in the such a uh, masterpiece of Racine and Moreau and we talked uh, when we first met with Anne about it and she she saved me because she she told me but you know it's like a, a concert suivi which was a quite common uh, practice in the 17th and 18th century to keep just the musical uh, passages of works uh, of this kind and so I kept like 10 uh, numbers of the Moro piece, and I think they are quite logical. And we start with the overture, then Pleurant Gémisson. And then when all is going to be uh, fixed, we don't have uh, areas of it because it's uh, Moro left it to the uh, to Racine. So I, I just introduced uh, two instrumental pieces. And then, Ryan, you, you explained the end of the piece. So. It was, and I think uh, the, the the instrumental pieces seem though to be very descriptive too. I noticed the one the prelude that Anne brought up, and when it has the falling it falling from the sky, it also reminded me when I was playing through it of tears, you know, um, and it's done I think after at a at a sad point when we don't know. Uh, it's uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. The uh, Dieu d'Israël is like a, a cry for help. And just after that, I introduced the first prelude. Actually, you you saw in the in the chat, um, and it's yeah, it's such it has it ba it's based only on descending motives, and actually the full title in French is uh, let me check uh, pour la piété qui descend du ciel, which means like for the piety that comes down from heaven. So it was just the perfect place to. Uh, symbolize the spirit of God uh, coming on earth and solving the issues of the Jewish people. And, and you also put a, a march right after the kind of military image yeah, in, the, the, in the just text. after the condemnation of uh, Haman. And so that's a big turning point in the in the area where all is uh, going backwards and the one who had the power is now uh, um, condemned and the mm -hmm. two are, are safe. So yeah, 
I think the this the excerpts musical excerpts have the power to describe the action. Yeah, one t one bit of the text I didn't understand, and maybe you and and Anne can can enlighten enlighten me. When the when the young um, Israelites talk about throwing off the ornaments of the, what is that? Why are they wearing something that they reject? Is that have to do with Haman has created a some kind of um, uh, ceremony at which they're required to wear th things? There's a you're not sure what I mean. Well, we'll look at it uh, after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I totally understand you. I think yeah, it's uh, just they don't want to be recognized at uh, Israelites, and but maybe Anne, you know more about it. Or... Do you mean in pleurons et gémissons? No, when they say uh, arachon, uh, ju just at the end of pleuron, oh, pleuron it's the, 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 um, the gesture of uh, taking out all jewels and beautiful things to to express uh, sadness. Oh, piety, so that any piety, they can piety and sadness and despair. Throw away luxury and just be pure with simple garments. Is that? Yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, well, we probably, you know, we um, uh, maybe we have some questions next. You know, in in a couple of weeks, you'll get to hear uh, Ben talk a little bit more about these two institutions and and Jonathan Woody, who's created the program, is with with Justin, and will be singing uh, singing in it. Um, uh, speak a little bit themselves about about their um, their take on this. But I wonder whether some of our audience has has questions that they'd like to um, ask you. Uh, we have um, both people from regular people in our audience, and as well as a few um, experts. I see, but please, I, any any question is a good question, and if even if you don't know anything about this era, I I didn't, and that's why I wanted to put the program together. So, I mean, if they also feel free to put your questions in the chat, and I'll ask them for you if you don't want to um, turn on your mic or your camera. So, yeah, yeah. Maybe just before the first questions, I also wanted to highlight some of the very specific in the Moro the writing. Please. Um, often in French music of this period, the orchestra is written in five parts, and here it's only in three parts with two uh, top parts and one basso continuo. So I think this is a kind of um, maybe less. Uh, massive setup and less thick and it allow, allows the action to be really intense and I quite uh, like this uh, this setup for the orchestra and much of that much of the handle is very sparely at least the the earlier version is very sparely written as well isn't it yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Well, while we're waiting for questions, maybe you could tell us a little bit of the handle. Oh, maybe Susan has the question there. Yeah. Hello. My French is very bad and very rusty, but I was surprised in the aria that you shared with us, Anne, that the king, the, the, it was a tutoyer versus a bouvoyer kind of um, speech, right? They, he's, they say two yeah. king instead of vous. Was, is that that sort of surprised me that that would seems presumptuous, but maybe it was to show that they are asserting a kind of equal status. I, I think it's a it's more um, taste of biblical. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, in the French poetry, spiritual poetry and prayers of the time. It's vous. You're right. But in this case, they wanted to, to 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 write it as if it was in the antiquity, with a different kind of religion. I, I knew that, I the noticed that. very but, next to God. But it's but it's the two is is not only to God, but it's also about the king, isn't it? Am I right? Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. It is. yeah. 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 Okay. But in Mesopotamia, king and God were the same. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the point with, uh, you know, Louis the Fourteenth, maybe. Uh, Boss Bossuet would not like that, though. No, no, he, no, of no, course. he wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank you. Other questions or thoughts that people would like to just comments to are welcome. So um, I might have missed this, but I know you mentioned Racine really had no interest in like opera or writing something that was going to be singing and performance. Why was that? Why was he so against it? You know, you know Racine was the leading uh, um, author of the uh, ancien. Uh, th there was a, a, a quarrel between anciens and modern. The anciens were um, uh, speaking Latin and defending the very French classical tradition, while the modern would defend opera, which is less tragic than tragedy. Opera and modernity, such as Fontenelle and uh, uh, Donald Vizet, the, the director of Mercure Galant. And so Racine started saying that he didn't like it, was, it was incoherent, it was, uh, it was unbelievable, uh, the plots of Kino for Lully's uh, tragedies in, in music uh, was, were not good poetry and, and so on. But uh, then he was commissioned um, an entertainment uh, uh, for Lully, and he couldn't refuse. And this is uh, Idil sur la paix, to commemorate, to celebrate a, a, a military victory. Uh, but it was not an opera. It, it was, you know, choruses of very, uh, with a great orchestra, very official music. And so it was different. But an opera has the problem of um, uh, making the plot uh, advancing. I, I don't know if it's clear, but... Um, and he didn't want that. Racine didn't want that. And Esther is quite a good solution because I, in my opinion, he also wanted to, to write something biblical. It was, you know, um, a rivalry with Corneille and Corneille wrote a, a beautiful spiritual tragedy, which is Polyucht. And probably Racine was, it was a kind of um, challenge uh, to him. Hmm. So... But it was not uh, in favor of opera. <laughs> so there's a question. Is there a are, are good solutions? Because choirs just express, you know, uh, um, pathetic expressions, and but the plot is uh, is spoken. So that may and that may kind of answer another question. We have a question, uh, at, uh, Justin. Um, uh, Jerry Murphy says, I'm always amazed that such wonderful pieces such, as, pieces such as these are only performed a few times, if at all, back in the 1700s, then completely disappear for almost 300 years. Do you want to speak to why you think that, why you think that is? It's a, uh, it's a, a long uh, question, but uh, be, because we need more Opéra Lafayette all over the place to, <laughs> to, to play these pieces, but I think the, the tastes have changed over the years. And like in 18, 19, 20th century, this music um, wasn't looked as good as the one of Mozart and Beethoven, then Wagner and, and so on. And the idea of uh, progress was quite strong and that each uh, generation was uh, better than the uh, previous one. And for now, uh, I would say 17, 70, 80 years, uh, there are um, growing interest for this uh, music. So we rediscovered first the very major works by uh, for French music, uh, Rameau, Lully. Uh, you know, maybe you, you've you heard about uh, Atis in the 80s and a lot of um, following uh, works. And, and now I think it's time to uh, discover all this unknown music, uh, never performed, uh, barely never recorded. And so that's that's why I feel so close to the Opéra Lafayette spirit, because, I mean, it's, it's so moving to see that uh, on the American side of the ocean, there are some musicians also interested into very unknown composers. Uh, on my side, I'm very fond of uh, Louis-Antoine Lefebvre, which is totally unknown, and I made the first recording of him. So um, I think there are still a lot, a lot of music uh, not known, and 
we need uh, to bring it alive again. It's it's you know it's interesting that certain um, certain composers who were in some ways more conservative were in the 19th century, whether it be Mendelssohn with Bach or Brahms mm. and, and Strauss with Couperin, were mm. discovering Baroque music again. But I think that not the things that hadn't still been discovered are, are some of the lighter music, which are more um, specific to the styles, not so much like this. I think this probably wasn't discovered in, in part because it was so, you know, you couldn't do a complete performance as you mm. suggested, You're, it's yeah. with a, done with a play. Um, Whereas other other music and and certainly a lot of the opera comique we've done is with since it is so attached to words it's hard to figure out how to do it, um, but um, but you know by hook or crook we'll find some way. So other questions. I, I, I have a, a fun story of uh, Claude Debussy uh, <laughs> hearing some Rameau in 1903 I think in, in the Scola Cantorum and. Maybe it was one of the first times he heard some uh, Rameau and he said like, uh, praise to Rameau and shame on Gluck. Yeah, like, yeah. And it was like the enthusiasm of rediscovering this um, style and this music. And I think it's still going on with uh, lesser known composers as Moreau. Yes, maybe there's also a material reason that music was incidental and would be used just once and then thrown away. Mm many times and the only uh, very conservative taste was that of the church who maintained what no no interest in changing and uh, modifying the repertoire so it was more conservative and thanks to choirs and cathedral archive we can we can find masses from the early 17th century for example in spain in france and um, there is a lot to do for musicians, but um, because they were conservative, oh, uh, the, uh, in the others, in the other milieus, one would just throw away past music and write a new one, and there was no interest in conserving in conserving music. And just I guess in what, exceptional uh, milieus such as the royal court or also. And I guess, oh, Ben, you have you have something you want to jump in. Well, if we have if we have time for another question. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, this this question is is for Anne. Um, for those who don't know, Anne has done just some tremendous, tremendous work rehabilitating the genre of school theater from the early modern period for scholars and, and for audiences. Um, I would love to know if you have any very general reflections for us about how school theater, the théâtre de collège, and this genre in this period compares with theater more generally. When we see a work of theater that was originally produced for this educational context, does it have specific characteristics that are different from uh, the theater at court or in the city for you? And should we treat it the same way today? Yes, yes. Uh, school theatre was more conservative in one in the one hand, because they would use more Latin. Then they gave up with Latin at the very end of, of 17th century. And I think it's the only country in the world who maintained Latin in uh, in uh, colleges was, um, was uh, Germany until the, the First World War. They maintain Latin in performing in uh, performances in colleges. Uh, Latin was used. There was incidental music, but the, the the structure of the plays was more flexible, and would be adapted to uh, the young the, the the young pupils because they, they were. Um, we we tried with my with my equipe with with my team to um, make a, a research on prosopography to try to understand who was singing, who was dancing in these performances. And we chose, of course, uh, an important college because there, there was an archive and even musical traces. It was Louis Le Grand in Paris, until today a very good, <laughs> a very good college. And uh, we found 
that uh, the some of the dancers uh, were very young they were seven and uh, um, then we 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 understood that they would um dance only in the great chacon at the end of the of the tragedy you know uh, tragedy would alternate with music intermeds and they would they would uh, uh, dance only maybe menuet in the early 18th century and uh, but above all this this final check on so we, they would just uh do some movements on stage but this the the great solos were performed by, by professionals and very good ones such as Picour, the better ones <laughs> You know, it's it's interesting to think about how in in dance you there are younger people who can um, do it as as well as as old as older people. I always remember when we did Felicia and David's La La Rouque with the Colonidi Dance Company. Um, I it was striking to me. I knew we had a couple of young people on stage who were doing smaller roles, like you say, you know, just f short appearances. But then and we then there were six. Um, uh, who seemed like totally professional dancers and I had to be told that one of those six dancers was 12 years old when she made her debut do it extensively with us at the at the Kennedy and Lincoln's uh, centers and it, you couldn't tell she was brilliant and and you know to to people who start dance that early I gather I gather you yourself have some training in dance Anne. yeah yes yeah. yes yes do you ever perform in some of these? Um, uh, uh, did you what perform? Just amateur. <laughs> I prefer not to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I dance in Alceste, but I'm not sure it was the, <laughs> huh? oh, well, it, the best performance. Yes, but yeah. you're right. Some 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 very young uh, musicians and dancers uh, were trained, such as uh, the princes and noble people. But in the case of colleges, um, we could identify that the, the professional dancers would come with their children. You, you, do you understand? This kind of enfant de la balle, uh, um, children trained from an early age, and they, will, they would mix on stage with the, the pupils to, <laughs> to make it more... Uh, to make it better, just uh -huh. as did the young ladies, the young professional singers, who would who, who helped the jeune fille de Saint Cyr to sing the, the solos. Well, I I'll, I'll, I I mentioned earlier um, that Philip Kennicott has, has written about, and he's but I don't think I told what he's compared. Um, he's compared. Um, being at court and being seen at court and seen as having to perform all the time to um, being on social media today and how what a conflict that was for Madame de Batnon to be at court and she preferred the world of education and of, of founding Saint-Cyr and um, and uh, and how how complicated it is for for young people today to be um, in that public sphere of of being online and uh, so there's some um i think there's some there's some ways which in which education and and how we present ourselves to the world um are are parallel between uh, this this world of sincere and and the world today which um we always try to figure uh, figure out what you know what is this why are we do why are we doing this and what does this mean to us today and in addition to just being fabulously beautiful and, and undiscovered um uh what do we um what else does it does it what other resonances does it have today so um and well, we'll I was say ryan it is 706 so i just don't want to hold anyone um but if the sure. if our speakers are amenable we would love to maybe keep you on for a few more questions i know i have another question for justin as well but i just wanted to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, thank you for joining us. If you do need to help off, feel free. But if you would like to stay on for maybe a few more questions, um, that would be great as well. And I see I see Karen has a question. Um, you can go ahead. And un you're un oh, yourself, you're, Karen. Yeah, you're muted. Uh, all right, there we go. You can hear me? 
Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was Googling Esther because I was trying to remember who wrote the opera I saw at City Opera of Esther. And it was Hugo Weisgall. So anyway, but then I was reading on and just looking at the comparison of the two synopses, you know, between Handel and, and Weisgall. And it gets into this thing of talking about the premiere of the Handel and all the foreign singers who could who just mangled the English. And, every, and it was commented on widely. And there was an anecdote from the 1732 premiere performance that they garbled the text so badly that Senesino singing, I come my queen to chaste delights came as I come my queen to chase the lice. <laughs> that was wonderful. So I'll always remember that when I hear that line. <laughs> yes, they were Italian singers actually. Yeah. Yeah. used to sing in Italian and they had Somebody to... said they might as well have been singing in Hebrew. They couldn't understand the word. <laughs> you can actually find a, 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 a version of this in Hebrew, sung on sung in Hebrew on, online. So, but, anyway, yeah. I'm going to pop off, but it's been lovely. Uh, thanks, Thank thanks, you, everybody. Her. Okay, bye-bye. And I guess, um, Justin, my question for you is, how did you get introduced into the world of opera? And what made you choose like the harpsichord as your profession? Because that is such a unique instrument. I know like as a very newbie to the opera world, I uh, really didn't know that instrument at all. And so I'm just curious how you came into that area. Yeah, uh, actually, I, I met the harpsichord uh, uh, quite young when I was like nine or 10 years old. Um, I, I was um, training as a pianist in my home city, which is Angers, actually the same one than uh, Jean-Baptiste Moreau, which is quite quite, uh, qu quite oh. funny because I, I spent all my childhood in Angers, like 18 years. So, um, but but I was born a, a, a bit later than, than Moreau, and um, yeah, so I, I discovered harpsichord when I was 10, and I. It's, you know, when you're so young discovering an a instrument, you don't know, you don't, uh, I mean, I didn't knew I was um, going to a very specific repertoire. I was just uh, loving playing harpsichord and I was uh, always fascinated by the, uh, I think the harpsichord is a very intimate uh, instrument for me more than piano because like you have the, the a very um, delicate sense of uh, plucking the string uh, under your finger because the mechanism of harpsichord is very very simple and you can really feel that you are plucking the string so and i always lo love this um this uh, sensation and of course the french repertoire for harpsichord is uh, really focusing on the resonance of the instrument of the singing how to uh, uh yeah, bring sensitivity to the harpsichord. And so quite naturally, I decided to become a professional. And then, of course, when you play harpsichord, there is some solo repertoire, but it's like you you need to to be uh, feed with also chamber music and orchestra music and, of course, the vocal repertoire. And so step by step, I, I began with the French cantatas like 10, 10 years ago, which are like very... Uh, tiny operas of about 20 minutes with two, three instruments and one singer. And uh, yeah, step by step, I um, went onto this way. And uh, actually, this project will be my first uh, leading as a uh, conducting from the harpsichord uh, orchestra. So I'm very excited. Really Which is, and we try to provide a lot of firsts, and and there's I, hardly I, not many young musicians who who have struck me as being as as wonderfully expressive and talented as Justin, and so I I thought you'd be a natural for for leading a group, and and um, so we're 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 looking forward to this a lot. Yeah, me too, and of course I, I also want to to speak about uh, wonderful musicians will be who will be um, evolved in this project. And first of them is uh, Jonathan, who is with us, I think, and who will be co-directing this uh, project. And just to say, I, I heard him in October in New York for an upcoming project of Opera Lafayette for a, an other unknown composer, but not truly Baroque, but... <laughs> and uh, I was just um, uh, blown away by your singing. So I'm so much looking forward to um make some music with you thank you very much justin and right back at you i'm and hi everybody i'm looking forward to this as well uh and 
to speaking with you all in two weeks. Um, we're going to talk more about these great pieces. So, yeah. Okay, it is now 7 <laughs> But if anyone um, has any one more question, um, if not, we'll go ahead and end it here. Just thank you so much for joining us. And we do hope to see you again on uh, January 31st when we'll have uh, Benjamin Bernard and Jonathan Woody with us. Yeah. Great. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you, Jace. And thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Anne. Thank, thank you, Justin.